Uh, good morning. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, today we will give uh, company results updates on cogen, normally press metal, geoenergy resources, and we will talk about uh, the sector report of uh, Singapore consumers. And finally, we will talk about the U.S. technical updates. Um, because uh, our analyst uh, Richard Liao is not around, so we'll skip the cogen and the Namni Press Metal. So we'll go to um, Geo Energy uh, directly. Uh, so this is Guangzhou. Um, Geo Energy Resources um, announced their third quarter results um, two weeks ago. Um, and our title is A Mass Watches Amid Robust Production. So we maintain our buy call with unchanged target price of 44 cents. Now let's take a look at the results. So um, both the top line and the bottom line um, increase um, significantly, mainly due to the higher um, crow prices and the ramp up of um, production volume. So this chart shows that um, both ASP and the um, sales volume um, increment um, in the third quarter and over the nine months this year. So it is worth noting that um, in the third quarter in October, GEO successfully uh, issued the new note with aggregate amount of uh, 300 million US dollars. So there is no doubt that they are able to pay back the MTM uh, deal in, the, in January next year and the MTM notes among uh, is around is a hundred million uh, sing dollars which is um, around um, 72 million US dollars so um, the net interest ex interest rate of this uh, new senior note is around um, 5 plus percent because the coupon rate of this is uh, 8 percent. Now the deposit rate of the this note is around 2 plus percent per annum. So we think that um, the issuance of this uh, new note will enhance the solvency as well as the liquidity. And also, the management revised down the uh, annual sales target from 10 million tons to 7 million to 8 million tons in FY17. Um, for the guidance of next year's uh, sales target, uh, they expect uh, the group can do uh, 12 million tons to 15 million tons next year. So next, I will pass on to Ling Sings to talk about the Singapore consumer sector. Thank you, Guangzhou. Uh, this is Ling Sings. So uh, today, I'll, I'll be uh, touching a bit on the e-commerce uh, environment in Singapore. So these are the few uh, key highlights uh, that we will be uh, looking into. So for um, the e-commerce uh, landscape in Singapore, we'll mainly look into the fresh products uh, where we found that uh, fresh products are the least vulnerable to uh, Amazon's uh, threat. As you know that Amazon uh, 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 entered into Singapore um, in July uh, this year. And secondly, uh, we'll look into uh, what are the forces that drive a uh, uh, Singapore uh, consumer. So mainly they will look into uh, the three main factors, price, variety, as well as convenience. Next, we'll look into uh, the e-commerce uh, challenges, where uh, it's, uh, although that is being perceived as uh, they, they save costs on uh, rental as well as labor costs, uh, it's actually a very capital intensive um, 
business they have to invest into extensive infrastructure logistics as well as uh, marketing uh, beforehand uh, next uh, we also uh, talk a bit about uh, the physical stores where we think that uh, is irreplaceable last but not least uh, we'll look into the two uh, things that we uh, we are unknown of uh, mainly coming from the uh, GST which the government uh, are reviewing uh, secondly it will be on the response from uh, other brick and mortar operators um, with this, um, we'll uh, focus on uh, why do we think that uh, it's a, it's a uh, buy call on uh, Xinjiang as well as dairy farm. Sorry. So for, for e-commerce landscape, um, as you know that uh, if anything that is small uh, that you can put into a box are uh, vulnerable to an uh, e-commerce threat, and uh, this is actually a survey by Statista where it uh, grouped all the consumer preference uh, for pro by product categories uh, globally uh, as of uh, 2017. And if you look far towards the right side, uh, this is the grocery, which includes uh, uh, the non-perishable uh, like canned, uh, canned food as well as uh, the perishables uh, which are the fresh uh, products mainly uh, vegetables uh, meat so the light blue bar indicates uh, the preference to buy online and the dark blue bar indicates the preference to buy it in store so as you know as you can see here 70 percent of uh, consumers prefer to buy it in store and if you look into the amazon's uh, core product offerings uh, there are things like electronics video games books and clothing these are the things that uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, you can put inside a box and ship it out but uh, groceries uh, they do offer groceries uh, but it's still limited online and we also note that uh, they have uh, recently acquired Whole Foods which has uh, more than uh, 200 stores uh, worldwide but uh, although that uh, this strengthened their uh, offerings for uh, fresh products but uh, they, they also announced uh, there were uh, about nine stores closure in the US uh, market. Why is it so? This is mainly because of the consumer's uh, preference. Based on PwC's uh, 2017 uh, total retail survey, there's only about 10% of uh, US consumers who prefers to purchase their groceries online. And that compared to... Um, Singapore's consumers, uh, about two thirds prefers to make it in store, meaning that one third, uh, pref only one third uh, prefers to buy it online. So these two thirds should be able to support uh, the physical uh, grocery stores. And we also, we remain, uh, uh, we continue uh, to think that uh, Singaporeans will continue to prefer to handpick hand -pick the pressure, perish sorry, <laughs> perishables and fresh produce. Uh, this is mainly driven by rising demand on our quality as well as our safety awareness, where you can see and touch the products uh, before you purchase. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, if you compare on the storage capacity, where it actually uh, provides an optimal uh, inventory stocking for uh, the, gross the grocers, if you look at the uh, if you look at the top three um, supermarket chains which have uh, physical stores, they have a uh, huge warehouses of fresh uh, distribution centers uh, in Singapore. As compared to Amazon Prime as well as Redmart, they only have uh, about 100 uh, k square feet uh, in uh, Singapore. So this actually provides uh, uh, these three supermarket chains to purchase in bulk thus uh, provide a lower pricing and uh, pass on the savings to consumers. Next, uh, we'll look into the, um, the e-commerce um, landscape in Singapore. As you know that uh, e-commerce e is nothing new in Singapore. Uh, it has already uh, been in Singapore for years, but 
as you can see from here, uh, the e-commerce market is very fragmented. There's no retail platform, uh, which is considered as the preferred platform for more than 20% of the consumers. This only imply uh, one thing, which is there's lack of uh, consume, uh, customer loyalty to a single platform in Singapore. Consumers are price sensitive. And um, because of uh, the internet, it actually uh, provides higher price transparency, hence uh, leading to more bargain hunting consumers. And we did a, a price uh, comparison uh, across all these, all, all the five um, online uh, groceries uh, or e-grocers. E do note that uh, for NTUC, Giant and Singsheng, uh, we only took the pricing of uh, the on their online platform. And uh, even if uh, it's not available online, uh, uh, do note that uh, it, it could be uh, available on their physical stores. And if you, com um, if you look at the um, highlighted um, uh, highlighted uh, pricing, this indicates that uh, it's the cheapest uh, price offer across all five um, operators. So if you look uh, vertically, you can see that uh, Amazon Prime actually uh, has the most price di discounts or promotions across. However, you also will note that uh, there are quite a lot of things that are not available uh, in uh, Amazon Prime. In that sense, uh, we think that variety as well as convenience uh, are two factors where uh, consumers might uh, look into. By being not able to uh, offer such a wide variety, and uh, we think that uh, consumers uh, generally would prefer to do a one-stop shopping, Amazon Prime might not be the <coughs> might not be the uh, prime option for them. And uh, if you zoom down to uh, the fresh products, which I've uh, highlighted in the red box, so as you can see that NTUC and Singsheng actually offered <coughs> more uh, price discounts uh, in terms of uh, the fresh offerings. In this sense, uh, you can. Um, we, what we have observed is that um, the, those supermarkets with physical uh, uh, presence, they can act, they they are of a larger scale and they can actually uh, purchase in bulk, thus uh, lower the input prices and uh, pass on the savings to consumers. So these uh, three uh, supermarkets chains actu actually has a. Uh, uh, better age in uh, both aspects of uh, availability as well as uh, pricing. Next, uh, we'll look into whether the cost structures of uh, the e-commerce or e-grocers are uh, sustainable or not. Yes, uh, as mentioned just now uh, on the that they could have uh, saved on rental as well as labor costs as compared to those with uh, a physical presence, but in return, they have to invest in extensive uh, infrastructure, logistics, as well as uh, marketing uh, before they can co uh, commence uh, business. And by um, consistently having a price cuts or uh, absorb uh, extra costs, as uh, unsustainable uh, cost structure of over the long term. And uh, you can see that uh, from one of the examples where Rakuten actually exit from Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia uh, last year. Then uh, as you know that uh, Amazon Prime uh, is uh, cutting prices uh, to gain market share. Uh, they are absorbing uh, delivery costs uh, at the moment. And with that, uh, we also took a look into the uh, annual membership fees for Amazon Prime globally. Uh, the Annual fee actually ranges about uh, $32 to $142 globally. So um, after the trial period ends, we might be slapped with uh, about at, at least uh, $32 uh, annual membership fee. And if you look at the, the more 
uh, established market uh, where Amazon Prime uh, had a, had gained a strong foothold in uh, other US, UK, Germany, as well as uh, Japan. So if we take the benchmark of Japan, uh, we might be uh, looking at 47. And uh, Amazon has been uh, increasing the annual fee uh, as they gain stronger foothold, as you can see from the France uh, example. So in this sense, uh, they themselves know that uh, by uh, this structure, this cost structure is unsustainable. And last but not least, uh, let's uh, relate to a pure e-commerce uh, um, or e-grocer uh, operator in Singapore, which is Redmart. Uh, it has an operating loss of 21 million in uh, 200, uh, in 2015, which also uh, indicate an operating loss margin at about 78%. Then uh, last but not least, uh, let's take a look at the physical stores. Why do we think that it is irreplaceable? Because a physical store will be able to offer a wider breadth and depth of uh, products. And uh, as we mentioned just now, uh, consumers generally, they prefer one-stop shopping. It also provides the ability to showcase uh, products as uh, seeing is believing. And uh, it will enable the uh, retailers to build on their brand equity as well. It also uh, would enable the retailer to provide a personalized uh, in-store experience, uh, enhance uh, customers' uh, interaction as well. And in Singapore, as uh, you know that Singapore is uh, relatively uh, smaller compared to um, our neighbors, and as also compared to uh, US as well as uh, to China side. So Singapore has a very uh, high store density. It has about 11.6 uh, square feet of uh, retail space per capita as compared to Hong Kong's 11.5, Bangkok's 8.6 as uh, Shanghai's, uh, which has the lowest at 4.8 square feet. And we also have been seeing that uh, uh, the click and collect uh, initiative has been gaining uh, more popularity. All three uh, supermarket chains, NTUC, uh, FairPrice, Giant, uh, as well as uh, Singzhong, they are actually uh, having this uh, click and collect um, initiative. We are also seeing more and more pure e-commerce players who are adopting an uh, online to offline strategy. Uh, for example, uh, as you can uh, see from the recent um, a recent uh, collaboration between Lazada and uh, Capital Mall, and here, <clears throat> sorry. And here we have a, a table to showcase you that uh, all three um, supermarket chains uh, have a very extensive uh, store network in Singapore, and they have, uh, and they they are uh, currently still ramping up their store count. Uh, do note that these uh, 531 stores are only pertaining to Singapore. The two unknowns uh, within this uh, sector would be the GST, uh, which government is reviewing on uh, uh, to impose on online um, online purchases. Uh, currently, it's tax free for uh, anything uh, under four hundred dollars. But by imposing this uh, GST, uh, it could help to level the playing field between uh, uh, local retailers and uh, offshore retailers. The next thing uh, we, are, uh, we are unknown of would be the response from other brick and mortar uh, operators. Will they uh, ramp up on their um, online strategy? Uh, if yes, this could uh, intensify the competition. So with that, uh, we maintain our overweight uh, view on uh, the Singapore consumer sector. We expect that uh, the uh, present uh, rebound in economic condition uh, to continue as well as to filter down uh, to fuel consumer sentiment. 
we have a, a buy call on uh, both supermarkets, Seng Xiong as well as the Reform. Both of these supermarkets uh, have their own uh, warehouse and fresh distribution uh, center in Singapore itself. Um, and this would allow them to ramp up uh, fresh offerings as well as uh, to reap uh, benefits from economies of scale. And uh, for fresh products, fresh products are the least uh, vulnerable uh, to Amazon's threat and also it could uh, yield higher margins. So through uh, improving uh, operating efficiencies, uh, this should be able to support their profitability and hence uh, make, them, uh, make their cost structure uh, more sustainable. They are also, uh, as mentioned just now, they are also uh, expanding their stores network, uh, bringing their presence uh, closer to the consumers. And with that, <coughs> sorry, and with that, uh, I would like to pass on the presentation to uh, Jeremy, who will talk about uh, the US uh, equity market. Uh, thank you, Linton. So uh, Jeremy speaking here. So for my part, uh, I'll be briefly going through an update on the US equity market uh, from the recession tracker point of view. So as you can see here on the screen, what we are seeing right now is uh, all clear for now and all remains well. And two months ago, we published a report uh, uh, releasing a list of indicators, nine indicators, and this is sort of like an install uh, a further part two of the first piece. So for today's presentation, we'll be going through another list of indicators, uh, up to six for monitoring the U.S. equity market. And the reason why we are so concerned about a major turnaround in the equity market is mainly due to the fact whereby uh, we are right now in a late stage economic cycle. And what I mean by that is uh, we have been showing this slide uh, for quite some time already. So as you can see over here in this table, we are right now in the 101 month of economic growth expansion uh, since 2009. And obviously this 101 month of growth is right now the third longest in economic uh, history. So you can see historically on average, the economic expansion cycle lasts around 60 months or so. Right now we have way surpassed that number and we are right now in the 101 month of growth. Uh, as well as we surpassing the housing boom period whereby the growth was around 73 months. And just by comparison wise, you can see the second longest was 107 months during the 1960s, 1970s decade. And then followed by the longest one that happened in the 1990s, the dot-com boom period of 119 months. Hence, uh, we are sort of uh, watching this very closely. Uh, it's just a matter of time before the market flips over to the recession side of things. But what our recession indicators are showing us is that uh, we still might see another six more months or so of economic growth before some sort of a weakness come in. So I will just go through more in depth what I mean by that uh, in the following slides. But just to re-emphasize again why we are uh, in this late stage economic cycle. So over here uh, on the chart you see the bottom panel shows you the S&P to VIX index ratio. Uh, basically taking the S&P 500 index divided by the VIX index. Uh, which gives us this particular ratio at the bottom, uh, shown by the black line. Uh, top panel is the S&P 500 index. So the main takeaway from this particular slide is uh, we are right now, again, uh, in some sort of a euphoria, unprecedented high. So recently we hit a ratio, this particular ratio hit a record high of 283. And normally, uh, each decade forms its own euphoria high. So for the current decade, the euphoria high that we actually uh, noted was this 192 mark that was formed back in 2014. And just to give you a brief feel of uh, how we use this particular ratio to uh, signal whether we are in a late stage economic cycle is to see where we are in terms of the uh, index. So during the dot-com period, you can see over here, 1990s decade, uh, the euphoria high point was around 73. And you can see pretty nicely once we hit the euphoria high, uh, the index will tend to just bounce around that particular area. And ultimately, once it moves into a blow-off phase uh, and forms its own respective top, uh, the bubble more or less... Uh, falls by itself. So during that period, euphoria high was 73 and the high came in at 91 and ultimately the vertical line marks the point whereby uh, the ratio itself uh, forms its top and you can see coincidentally the S&P 500 also topped out uh, at around the same time and fell 47% uh, during that three, three year period. So during the housing boom period, uh, pretty similar pattern, euphoria high right now becomes at a higher level instead of 73, it forms itself at 118 euphoria high and 
the top was formed a few years later in late 2007 uh, with a high of 145 before the bubble pop. So you can see over here during the housing boom period, uh, this particular index, this ratio index actually gave us a pretty good warning sign of a topping of the market. So during this case, the vertical line happened in around February of 2007 and actually gave us a 34 weeks lead uh, in terms of warning that the market is going through some sort of uh, correction. And ultimately, the uh, subprime crisis happened uh, in late October of 2007. So using this matrix, it gives us a good flavor about uh, where we are in terms of the economic cycle as well as whether we are in a euphoria stage. And obviously, clearly looking at where we are right now at the uh, right side of this particular slide, uh, you can see right now we are hovering at the top right-hand corner of things. So obviously, the high of 283 is way, way higher than the previous two euphoric high, as well as the current decade high of 192. Hence, uh, again, to re-emphasize that we are in this day stage economic cycle and right now in the euphoria stage. Uh, another thing we like to uh, highlight over here is uh, why we like the VIX index so much, so much is because uh, you can see over here, this is the VIX index on a daily time frame. Uh, and what we want to highlight over here is uh, the VIX index actually shows major crack signs and vulnerability as opposed to what is being shown in the uh, Broadway's equity market such as the S&P 500 index. So you can see these two highlighted regions over here uh, show the point whereby we only saw May, uh, small down days within the S&P 500 index around in October and November period. Whereby during the same period, the S&P 500 index only fell around 1.2%-ish. Uh, however, on the flip side of things, you can see the VIX index, uh, which measures the implied volatility of the S&P 500 index, uh, showed a different adverse reaction. So during the period whereby S&P 500 index only fell around 1.2%, uh, the VIX index actually spiked uh, to a range of 30 to 45% each uh, during those uh, respective time periods. Hence, we believe by watching the VIX index, it gives us a better feel of what's happening underneath the market rather than just looking at the S&P 500 broad based index. And in the following slides, I will explain more how we use this VIX index to actually uh, pinpoint major crack signs within the market. So like I mentioned earlier in the first slide, uh, here is the list of new indicators that we are adding into our recession tracker. So the original list of indicator, uh, we have nine. Right now we are adding six more into the recession tracker to make it more wholesome. And for the current list, you can see uh, it can be separated into two uh, subset, price section related, which are the following VIX index, the S&P 500 index quarterly time frame, the 10 year treasury U, and then the economical data, uh, which includes the ISM manufacturing PMI, unemployment claims, year on year change, as well as the retail sales year on year uh, growth. I will just uh, dive in deeper uh, on each individual uh, indicator to explain how I actually use them to spot for uh, major market turning points. So for the first one, uh, like I mentioned again, VIX index is a very important indicator that we like to watch uh, because it shows the true nature of what's happening uh, in the market. So how we actually use the VIX index to watch for uh, major weaknesses uh, signs of trouble are being highlighted by a paradigm shift higher within the VIX index. So we need to see a violent spike within the VIX index. And this violent spike actually needs to hold. And here are the criteria that needs to hold in order for us to see that kind of sustained weakness. So point one, we need to see that <coughs> VIX index actually uh, consolidating around the 10 euphoric floor for a prolonged period to signify bubble-like behavior. Uh, point number two is to see unexpected sub-spikes in the VIX index uh, leading to a breakout higher above its normal range. And then point number three is we need to see the VIX index actually forming a new floor from a euphoria floor of 10, uh, shifting higher to a new panic floor of 16. And then ultimately the point whereby the market actually flips over is when we get a second retest of the 16 panic floor. Uh, to make it more clear of what I mean, uh, here's the case study uh, during the dot-com period. So the top panel over here is the <coughs> S&P 500 index. And the bottom panel over here is the VIX index. So I mark up each point, point 0.1 to point 0.4, pretty nicely in this chart to uh, explain what I mean. So you can see during the uh, dot-com boom period of 1990s, the VIX index actually tracked pretty nicely between this range, 28.3 being the upper range as well as the euphoria floor of 10. So like I mentioned again, uh, to sig sig uh, signal that we are in a late stage economic cycle as well as euphoria, uh, we need to see the VIX index actually hovering around the 10th floor for a prolonged period. And ultimately for point two to come in is to see anomaly spikes uh, being highlighted by these two red zones over here. So the anomaly spikes need to come in to break above its normal range. 
So during the dot-com period, the range was around 28.3, which happened somewhere in the late period of 1997. And once the anomaly spike happened, uh, we need to see a paradigm shift away from the euphoria floor of 10 to a new euphoria, uh, new panic floor of 16. So point three more or less tells us that the market is going through some sort of a weakness. And ultimately, once we get the retest of this 16 panic floor to confirm the sustained weakness, uh, you can see what happened. So this vertical line is the point whereby we get a second retest of the 16 panic floor. And ultimately, you can see the S&P 500 index uh, fell together in line pretty perfectly when we get a retest and a uh, move higher in the VIX index. So during that period, uh, once the signal was confirmed, the S&P 500 index actually fell 47%. A very similar pattern played out again in the housing boom period. So all the way from 2002 all the onwards until 2007, you can see the VIX index actually moved pretty nicely within this range, uh, which we term complacent paradigm. And point number one came in slightly somewhere around 2005, as well as late 2006 whereby we see the VIX index actually bounce uh, off this, this 10 euphoria floor for uh, quite some times. And ultimately, once uh, in around Q3 of 2007, uh, the anomaly spike happened, shown by the red zones. Uh, anomaly spike above its normal threshold of 23.81. Uh, it's actually signaling that something might be wrong uh, within the market. And for point three wise, you can see, uh, we need to see the VIX index, like I mentioned again, to reset the euphoria floor to a new panic floor from 10 to 16, which more or less tells us that there is actually a shift within the trend for the VIX index. And ultimately, when, once the 16th floor is being formed, a uh, re-establishment of the 16th floor, the second retest will more or less give the further confirmation that the market is sort of uh, going through a crisis, which is what is being confirmed by the top panel over here, which is the S&P 500 index. Uh, once that happens, you can see the S&P 500 index actually uh, accelerated itself off. And after that point, you can see the market just crashed 51%. Uh, for the following one year or so. So you might be wondering where we are right now. So here's the VIX index, the current outlook. Still pretty nice in terms of where we are, only in the early stage of stage one, the euphoria phase. So here's the complacent paradigm that I mark out. So pretty similar to what happened during the housing boom period. So since 2012, we have been moving pretty nicely. We need the 27.7 range high uh, to the current low of around 10. And even more recently, you have seen the VIX index actually bottom bounce around this. Uh, 10 euphoria floor for quite a multiple times. So right now we are safe to say that we are only in stage one uh, of uh, this particular VIX index and we haven't even seen any massive spike above this 27.7 level. So moving forward, we believe just purely by using the VIX index itself, uh, we could still easily see six more months of upside in the equity market uh, before we actually see a paradigm shift uh, within this euphoria phase. So phase two, which is a break above this 27.3, needs to happen. And ultimately phase three, whereby we need to see a reset of the euphoria floor to a new panic floor of 16. Uh, once that happens, the last move that needs to come in is the second retest of the 16 panic floor to confirm the sustainableness. All in all, for that particular three points to play out, uh, we could easily see another six more months of development before we see point four comes in. So again, it's safe to say that probably we could still see further upside within the equity market. Uh, just by using the VIX index as a guideline. For indicator 2, uh, another price action based indicator, uh, we took a look at the S&P 500 uh, index quarterly time frame. And again, we can actually break down the market into uh, three stages, uh, mainly early stage bull market highlighted by consecutive bullish quarters uh, shown in the yellow boxes, uh, late stage bull market or blow off phase highlighted by a bearish quarter disrupting the prior bullish quarter streak and ultimately the start of the bear market highlighted by at least two consecutive bearish quarter in the red box. Okay, I'll just illustrate what I mean by that uh, in this particular chart. So here's the S&P 500 index on the quarterly time frame and the up arrows uh, point towards uh, where the start of the bull market happened and in a early stage bull market consecutive bullish quarters are norm which is what happened since 1995 all the way until 1998 and once we sort of a see a bearish quarter comes in and disrupt the previous bullish quarter streak. Uh, what it's telling us is that uh, the market is going through a blow off phase next, which was what happened over here where we saw six quarters of blow off phase. And ultimately the confirmation of the uh, bull market uh, will be signaled by a consecutive two quarters of uh, negative quarters over here. So I think 2Q or Q3 or 2000, that was when we get the second bearish quarter, first one being the one here. 
uh, the main ones, the second one came in. Uh, you can see, or more or less, uh, be sure that the market is ready to turn around, which then marked the dot com high. So during that period, the S and P 500 shed around 45 percent, and a similar pattern played out again in the housing boom period of 2000. So around 2002 Q2 or Q3, uh, we started our early boost, our early stage boom market, and this particular red bar over here actually kickstarted the blow off phase. Uh, which lasted six quarters as well, similar to the one we had during the uh, dot com period. And again, like I said, uh, highlight the red over here shows you the consecutive two quarters of uh, bearish bars. So similar pattern played out during the GFC, whereby the bursting of the bubble was being confirmed by at least two bearish quarters over here, which then exacerbates the sell off and the market fell around 46% uh, after we get the second bearish quarter. So the current stage right now where, where we are, so we started our early stage bull market back in 2009, pretty nice bullish uh, streak to the upside, and only somewhere in Q2 or Q3, that was when we get our first warning sign whereby uh, the red bearish quarter came in. But when the first one actually forms into the market, uh, it's telling us that the market is going through a blow off phase. So you can see since 2015, we have been pretty uh, nice moving in a bullish blow off phase, whereby we have seen eight straight quarters of bullish uh, bars without any sign of a weakness. So moving forward right now, even uh, as of now, uh, S&P 500 has been breaking new high. Uh, what it's telling us is that the blow off phase could actually last longer than what we expected. Previous two examples over here lasted for only six quarters and right now we are way surpassed this particular six quarter streak. So uh, using this particular indicator, uh, what we want to look out for uh, for any major turning point is uh, it needs to at least form two consecutive quarters of a uh, bearish quarter in order for us to sort of uh, get an idea that the market is ready to turn around. As of now, there isn't any sign of the uh, bearishness yet within the market, and hence we believe that the market still has further room to go to the upside. Moving to the economical data point of view, so here's the ISM manufacturing PMI, which basically is a sentiment that tracks uh, purchasing managers uh, from the manufacturing side and industrial side of things. So in the previous report, uh, we gave an update, a more in-depth view on what the consumer sentiment are doing. Uh, to give you guys a more wholesome view, uh, we actually uh, provided this industrial manufacturing PMI uh, to get a sensing of what the whole economy is doing. So using the ISM manufacturing PMI, uh, the following criteria needs to be present in order for us to spot for market weakness. So you can see over here, point one to three, uh, what we have noted is that ISM manufacturing PMI needs to enter into a euphoria high of 58.1, and then a reversal of the trend to the downside, and ultimately for the ISM manufacturing PMI to stay at least uh, below the 50 line for two months or more. So you can see over here at the bottom panel is where the ISM manufacturing PMI is. Uh, the 50 line shows you a uh, contraction or expansion. So a reading below 50 shows contraction while reading above 50 shows contraction. And I've marked up point 1, 2, and 3 to tell you uh, which stages we are at. So during the dot-com period over here, you can see we take the euphoria high. And once we take the euphoria high of 58.1, uh, there's a major reversion uh, within the index. And ultimately, the vertical line over here, the markets, the point whereby we get the two consecutive months of reading below 50 which then you can see uh, sort of uh, form itself uh, as the dot-com high as well. So market fell 46% when that happened, and a pretty similar pattern played out again during 2008-ish period. So we tagged the euphoria high back around in 2004, and once it hits the euphoria high, uh, somehow or other the main revision property is uh, pretty apparent here, and uh, the trend actually reverses once it hits the euphoria high of 58.1. And ultimately, point number three needs to come into play whereby we need to see at least two consecutive months of uh, reading below 50 to confirm the sustained weakness, which happened around in March of 2008. And once we get that kind of a signal, you can see uh, the market actually went into a deep dive and confirmed its GFC high. And market fell 46% during that kind of period. So right now, uh, we have actually seen a strong reversal and trend in the PMI since around 2016, moving pretty nicely in this uptrend. Uh, but right now, we are tagging the euphoria high of 58.1. Recent high has been surpassed the 60 high, uh, and if you would use the main revision count kind of property once we hit the euphoria high, chances are that it will continue to bounce around this area and reverses its trend. 
but ultimately what needs to happen is for the trend to actually sustain and for the PMI data to actually fall below the 50 uh, level for at least two consecutive months to signal real weakness. Uh, and in order for that to happen, we can still easily see another six more months of development before uh, we see a contractionary data come into play. Hence, uh, like I mentioned, time frame wise, we can still easily see six months of uh, growth in the S&P 500 index before some sort of a market weakness comes in. Uh, for indicator number four, another economical data. So retail sales year on year growth pretty much uh, shows you the similar picture to the previous slide. So uh, retail sales data actually also supplements our consumer sentiment indicator. So basically this one tracks the purchasing power of a consumer for uh, personal consumption as well as for household consumption. So our observation shows that the key threshold to watch over here is the 1.6% uh, mark that I've actually highlighted here in the chart, this horizontal line. And you can see historically, uh, once the retail sales on your data actually falls below the 1.6% mark for a prolonged period, uh, highlighted by the red zone over here as well as the red zone over here, you can see what happened to the market. Uh, retail sales data is more of a lag lagging indicator uh, to confirm the general weakness uh, due to the fact whereby you can see uh, it doesn't really identify the market top, but it more or, like, more or less confirms the weakness within the market. Uh, you can see over here the trigger point happened only in March of 2001, slightly later than the previous few indicators that I've shown, but it gives you a good indication whereby the market as a whole is weakening. So once it falls below 1.6% mark, you can see and take this as a cue that the market is really going through some uh, great shift uh, to the bearish side. So the same thing happened around in March of 2008 whereby we got the signal uh, the retail sales on your data fell below 1.6%. Same thing over there, you can see uh, it actually exacerbates uh, exacerbated the market sell-off by the S&P 500 index fell 50% thereafter. So currently the outlook for the retail sales data still shows pretty decent uh, number. Right now the last reading shows 4.6%. Still a far cry away from the 1.6% mark that we have highlighted. So again, uh, to re-emphasize, even for us to take the 1.6% mark, we could still easily see six more months of development before that happens. Uh, hence, we remain bullish on the equity market until the indicators are being triggered. Uh, and last but not least, the unemployment claim uh, data on a year-on-year -year change growth perspective. So the unemployment claim numbers that you usually read on the news are the weekly unemployment claims. Uh, we prefer to look at this data set over here because it strips out the seasonality effect. And you can see the pattern played out uh, pretty nicely uh, at single point in time to tell you when the market is going through some reversal. So uh, for the current trend, you can see the key threshold to watch. Uh, right now it's this 4.5% threshold mark. I'll just briefly go through the previous two examples over here during the dot-com as well as the housing boom period uh, of how we actually use the threshold to spot for major market weakness. So during the 1990s period, you can see the upper threshold for the unemployment claim was around 19.4%. Uh, as well as during the housing boom period, the upper threshold was around 14%. Uh, once the unemployment claim actually spiked above its normal range, uh, whereby it shows the anomaly spike by these two red zones, uh, you can see what happened to the market. Particular, particular line in the chart over here uh, marks the point whereby we get the anomaly spikes. You can see during the dot-com period, it sort of uh, aggravated the market sell off. The uh, market took it as a cue to actually uh, deep dive for 40%. And same thing over here during the GFC period. Uh, the market sold off 50% once we get the abnormal spike above its normal upper threshold. So since 2011, we actually got a kind of similar pattern whereby the unemployment claim here on your data forms its upper threshold of 4.5%. And since then, you can see how well respected this line have actually come into play. Multiple retests of this 4.5% threshold mark uh, further confirms this as a critical line to watch. So unemployment claim right now stands at negative 4.4%. Again, still a far cry away from the 4.5% mark. Uh, hence, the timeline of six, six more months of growth within the market is pretty reasonable uh, for Mark ET. So until the unemployment claim actually triggers this 4.5% threshold mark, uh, we believe that the market should continue to grind higher moving forward. And the very last indicator over here that we want to highlight is the 10-year treasury yield. So as more of the smart money congregates within the uh, bond complex, uh, we believe that's the reason why the 10-year treasury yield is able to sort of a signal the market top way before the equity market bubble pop. So you can see during these two examples over here, 
during the dot-com period as well as the subprime period, uh, the ten-year treasury actually topped out pretty nicely uh, nine weeks and 15 weeks before, respectively, during the dot-com as well as the GFC period. Uh, and how we actually use the ten-year treasury yield to actually spot for market weakness is uh, for more confirmation of the top within the 10-year treasury yield, uh, two things need to happen. We need to see the 10-year treasury actually breaching the multi-year uptrend line and then subsequently form a new 52-week low uh, shown by this particular red box over here. You can see what happened once we get that kind of a signal uh, that the 10-year treasury has already topped out. Uh, it corresponded pretty nicely with the top within the dot-com bubble. And then the same one kind of a pattern played out again in 2007. Uh, whereby you can see this 10-year treasury actually broke its multi-year uptrend line and ultimately once it's formed its new 52-week low, uh, you can see what happened. Uh, market fell 50% pretty nicely in line with the 10-year treasury yield. So the current outlook for the 10-year treasury yield, last reading for the 10-year treasury is at 2.3% and we have actually marked this particular multi-year uptrend line that was formed back in 2016. Uh, as of now, 10-year treasury is still pretty safe uh, above this particular multi-year uptrend line. Uh, like I mentioned, two things need to happen for us to get a confirmation that uh, the 10-year treasury has topped out. Uh, it, it first needs to break below this 2.3, this multi-year uptrend line, and then ultimately uh, break below the 2.06 uh, key threshold. So the 2% threshold will actually mark the point whereby the 10-year treasury low will actually uh, form its new 52-week low. So all in all, even by looking at the 10-year treasury perspective, uh, it's still pretty much moving in a range bound. Uh, price action from around 2.4% to 2.2%. So un until we get a major move within the 10 year treasury yield to the downside, uh, we believe that the equity market as a whole should continue to grind higher from here on. And hence, in summary, uh, this is the table to show you uh, the few of the recession indicators that we are following. So those in bold are the ones that I've just talked about for the past 20 minutes. And those at the bottom are the uh, rest of the indicators that were mentioned in the previous uh, Report. So ultimately, I'll just point your attention to the uh, utmost right column over here. Ultimately, what it's showing is that in terms of the bearish signal wise, none of the indicators are flashing red yet, uh, which is why we remain bullish on the equity market as a whole. And like I just shown you in the previous few slides, uh, we could easily still see six more months or so of upside for the equity market before some of these indicators actually uh, breach its uh, respective threshold. So hence, you can see. Uh, We've shown this chart before, uh, the deep buying roadmap, uh, with the belief that the market should continue to grind higher from here on for at least six more months or so. Uh, this strategy of deep buying using the 20 and 60 day moving average actually provided a pretty reliable uh, pattern to actually time the market uh, correction. You can see over here, uh, I've highlighted the orange color area. Those are the points whereby the market actually reversed its correction back into the uptrend pretty nicely whereby the red line is a 20 day moving average, the blue line is a 60 day moving average. We can see how the 20 and 60 day moving average acted pretty perfectly as a springboard for every correction that happened. So even for the most recent example over here back in around 20, November, uh, there was some major consolidation around the 20 day moving average for about two trading weeks. And ultimately you can see how the 20 day moving average continued to support price and propel price higher to break for new record highs. So for the S&P 500 wise, in terms of uh, target to the upside, we believe that the S&P 500 will continue to move in the tranches of uh, 50 points or so. So for current, uh, we believe uh, 2700 will be next, followed by 2750, 2008, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the price action wise for the S&P 500 should continue to uh, tread along the 20 and 60 day moving average for its correction. And pretty much similar pattern for the Nasdaq 100 as well as the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So I wouldn't go through as much in detail over here. But ultimately the key or important thing right now uh, for the Nasdaq 100 is uh, we are right now tracking the 20 day moving average. So if this pattern were to play out, uh, we believe that the 20 day moving average will continue to hold. Chances are that we are going to see the Nasdaq bounce higher from here on uh, to retest the round number of 6,005 to 6,006. And hence, uh, in summary, uh, here's what we see. So the S&P 500, we believe right now is in a blow-off phase. But based on indicators, uh, it's still saying that the blow-off phase could last longer than expected. And we could still easily see six more months of upside 
uh, we found some of the indicators are being breached. So all in all, we believe the equity market should continue to grind higher from here on and buy the deep strategies to continue to dominate the market like I just shown you in the previous two slides. But the 20 and 60 day moving average continues to act as a springboard uh, to propel price higher. So in terms of tradable instruments wise, uh, here are some of the ETF as well as the CFDs to capitalize on the move to the upside. And for those that have actually missed our first report on the nine indicators that we have mentioned in the table, uh, just refer to the link over here for the report as well as the webinar where we go in depth uh, <clears throat> about how we actually use the particular indicators to spot for uh, major market weakness. And yeah, with that, uh, we've come to the end of today's webinar. Uh, we'll open the floor to any questions uh, in the meantime. Thank you. Hi, hey, there's a question asking over the recent U.S. Senate passing of the corporate tax spur another round of bull run for over 12 months. Uh, we believe that what we have seen, especially from the last Friday's price action wise in the U.S. market, uh, most of the move for the tax cut has already been priced in, uh, which explains the sharp spike and the new all-time high within the market that we have seen last Friday. So in terms of spurring the market for another 12 months of bull market, uh, purely just based on the tax uh, bill cut, uh, we don't really see that as a catalyst anymore. But uh, short term wise, you can see more uh, major move within the market just based on uh, purely the confirmation of the tax bill cut. So right now, I think the US side of things, uh, there will be a reconciliation of uh, things between the Senate and the House in order to pass this bill through. So until we get the news for that, uh, we believe the market should continue to stay stagnant. And once that happens, we can see another jolt higher within the market in the short term. But in terms of a 12-month bull run, uh, we don't really see that happening uh, from that piece of news by itself. Hi, there's a question asking uh, which are the forward indicators in our analysis. So here's the whole list of indicators that we are watching. So all in all, most of it are sort of a leading indicator except for I would say uh, retail sales. Uh, as well, yeah, retail sales I think is the only one that is sort of a lagging. Whereas the rest are sort of a leading indicator whereby it tells us exactly or uh, at least with at most two to three months lag in terms of where the market top is. So all in all, we cannot really just take one indicator by itself to spot for market top. Uh, we need to see at least uh, a group of indicators by itself actually confirm the bearish signal in order for us to get a greater confidence that the market is falling over. So ultimately, until that happens, uh, I think that shouldn't be a worry uh, for the current period.
Right, there's a question asking, uh, do we actually use these uh, analyses for the SDI to find recession? Uh, we haven't really done an in-depth study in terms of using a list of indicators to spot for weakness within the SDI. But U.S. being the big boy of all, uh, we believe uh, the rest of our market should take cue from the U.S., which is why we place much emphasis on the U.S. and have studied uh, so deeply into the U.S. recession tracker. So ultimately, I think when the day comes whereby once the recession tracker actually signals rate for all the indicators, uh, there's a high likelihood that the U.S. market should flip over and at the same time, uh, most of the major equity market uh, regionally as well as internationally should also affect, get affected uh, in the same way. Hi, there's a question asking, uh, do we actually have a regular update for the recession tracker? Yes, uh, we actually do uh, keep a monthly update on this particular recession tracker. So uh, somewhere in between the month, uh, around I think the week of 15 to 20, I think that is the time when we actually do the monthly update for the indicators. So yeah, keep a lookout on uh, the recession indicators on, on a month-to-month -month basis, whereby we'll give a update on what's happening for each individual indicators. And for all the reports wise, uh, it can be found on stocksbnb.com. And someone asking for a watch list for the Philip 20 portfolio, yeah, it can also be found on the stocksbnb.com. Uh, yeah, just refer yourself to the stocksbnb.com whereby uh, that is where our reports are all being uploaded to. There's a question asking the correlation between the SDI and the S&P 500 is it still valid. Uh, we note that especially in the more recent uh, example, the SDI seems to be lagging behind the uh, US market uh, somehow or other. But all in all, when the major moves come in the market, especially huge upswings or huge downswings due to major market events, uh, uh, we see that historically during like the dot-com as well as the subprime period, major, major events actually do uh, cause the market to move in a certain direction at the same way. So mainly again to take cue from the US market as being the big boys, uh, we see a lot of uh, reminiscence coming from the US market whereby the rest of the market should follow suit especially once we get major events uh, coming to the market. Hi, um, we have a question um, whether the current bank stocks are too high and it's time to take profits. Well, I mean, um, it is good to take partial profits but to continue to stay invested. I think uh, most of the investors have a um, psychological impression of what the bank stock prices should be based on um, 
the, the past 10 to 20 years. But I think we cannot use the same uh, approach to how we look at at the, at the bank prices because the, the, some of the uh, there are some of the fundamental changes to the bank to the way banks are operating. One is of course we know of the digital initi um, initiate uh, initiation initiatives, which will uh, really drive up uh, customer uh, transacted activity. So you will see a lot more turnover on that. Uh, that's in addition to all your normal cyclical um, business trends like uh, housing loans, construction loans, and all that. So, when we are seeing that the the economic cycle is picking up, we can we can have the added boost of the um, extra or uh, added volume of customer transactions that will come in. Then, second part is of course the um, overseas expansion. So um, it is something which we, we are beginning to see uh, that uh, the, the banks are doing more aggressively compared to uh, uh, five to ten years ago, which is moving um, uh, their operations overseas. Of course, um, if we were to look back at uh, DBS, DBS's attempt to buy the, the Danamon, uh, Indonesian uh, Bank of Dan, uh, Danamon Bank, and then it failed and all that, uh, that's of course the licensing issue and all that, but with digital capability, um, they can do so and approach the market without um, all these uh, complicated uh, structures. Of course, naturally they will still have to to have that license, but uh, in terms of operation, um, they will have um, a lot more leeway. Thank you. Okay, since uh, there is no more questions, uh, we'll end today's webinar here. Thank you very much for tuning in and, and we hope to see you guys again next week.